What's up guys, my name is Mike Sabo and today we're going to build this 1985 Yamaha Tri-Z250 engine. This video is going to apply to the 85 and the 86, those are the only two years that it was made. It may also apply to, I believe it's the 83 and 84 Yamaha YZ250, but don't quote me on that, but there should be some shared components and it could help you out with those builds as well. Now this is a fairly easy engine to build, however, it was not easy finding information on how to build. I've got the original service manual right here. This is from 1984, it is made for the 1985 YTZ250N. That The YTZ250 is the name for the Tri-Z and the N is the 1985 model. So the book came out in 1984 and a bunch of the schematics in here are actually for the 1984 YZ250, which is why I think a lot of the components and the way that this is built is shared with the YZ250. So I would definitely recommend getting your hands on one of these service manuals if you can, but just keep that in mind that there's some stuff in here that it actually it's wrong. So that's what the purpose of this video is. Uh, I think I've figured this engine out pretty pretty damn good, and uh, hopefully I can help you with your engine build as well. Now that being said, these build videos are for reference only. I've been building engines and uh, you know tinkering with engines and stuff for literally like 15, 20 years uh, since I was like a little kid. And uh, I've just, I'm just really good with this stuff. And just keep that in mind though, I'm not a certified technician or anything. I didn't go to a trade school or anything like that. So these videos are for reference only, but again, I'm pretty damn good at what I do and this should be able to help you get through your build. So we're gonna jump back in time in a second here to when this engine was all torn down. Before I do that, I wanted to remind you guys that there is an entire build series on this Yamaha Tri-Z. Uh, it was in terrible shape when I got it and we fully restored it. There's an awesome build series on it. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Now, if you are using this Yamaha service manual throughout the entire video, I will have the section you can refer to in the top right corner of this video. Now, if you stay tuned to the end of the video, you will get to see the engine that we build in this video running and how it performs on the sand dunes. And last but not least, if you do enjoy the video or you get any value out of it, please give me a thumbs up. That does help me out tremendously and consider subscribing for more content like this. All right, guys, let's hop back in time to when this engine was torn down and get started. So I've got all my bearings in place. Most of the seals are in there, but there are three seals that I want to do with you guys. And I also want to do the bearing retainers. Then once we get those in place, we'll put our crankshaft and our transmission in. So these are the crank seals and installing these, the service manual is pretty vague. So I wanted to show you which way these go. Uh, they say to put the writing on the outside. So you can see on the seal, they're actually the dimensions right there. All the writing is on the outside. There's nothing on the inside. So we're going to put it with the, with the, the lettering on the outside. Same thing with this one. Lettering on the outside, there's a little key right there, right there, and on the inside, there's nothing. So the one with the larger inner diameter is gonna go on your clutch side. There's a collar that goes in here, pretty typical of most engines. So we'll put this in place. Sometimes these press right into place. Before I do that, I'm gonna take a little bit of high temperature bearing grease, wheel grease, and I like to coat the outside of the seal. This just kind of helps it go in, in a little bit easier and also uh, it keeps it from getting seized in there because sometimes these damn things, they don't want to come out. A lot of times you can just press these in by hand. You want to pop around the other side. It can be difficult doing this stuff with the camera in my face. And you want to try to get these to go in evenly, but that doesn't always happen. If you can't get it in by hand, you can use something like this. This is actually for my uh, steel bender, but a uh, socket will work just as well. And then we've got a dead blow. The big thing is you don't want to tap on the inside of the seal. So you're just kind of tapping around the outside. And the goal is to get it to go in evenly. Right, like that looks good, nice and flush and even. And while we're here, we'll put a little bit of grease in our inner lip so that we don't forget for later on. All right, now we will switch to our other case half. Get these seals in. So this will be the seal with the smaller inner diameter. And if your seals look different than these, sometimes, depending on what brand you have, they may have different markings. So just be aware of that. This one's gonna need a little encouragement too. It 
it may sound like I'm really hitting this hard, but just kind of giving these medium taps, letting it work its way in. You don't really want to rush any of this stuff because if you ruin a seal, you're going to be stuck ordering a new one. Now, I don't know if you guys can see, but this seal is not going in even. This one side, no matter how I tap this, is going in lower. So I want to bring that back up. You want these or, um, seals to be flush. Now, a seal puller will probably damage that. So I'm going to go in here. It can be kind of tough with this whole housing around here. Key is to be really careful. So I've got, again, a nice wide flathead. This is the side that's just a little bit low, like a, like a millimeter, practically. So we're going to go in here. You want to make sure that you don't damage that inner lip. We want to get beyond that. And we're just gently feeling for the outside lip. Get that screwdriver under there, and we're just going to twist it a little bit. Very gently. Oh, you see? Lifted it up. Right like that. And now we're good and flush. Now the last seal is the countershaft seal. The reason that I didn't put this in isn't to show you how to put that seal in, but I wanted you guys to be able to see our output shaft bearing. So you can see I've got no shield on this bearing on either side. And the reason I wanted to point that out is because from what I understand, if you order this bearing brand new, it will come as a double shielded bearing. Now a shielded bearing is like this one right here. You see it's got this black shield on it that is protecting um, the ball bearings. Usually if it's got a double shield, it's because there's lubricant inside and it wants to keep that lubricant nice and clean and dry. Now this is for an engine, so on the transmission side, there's gonna be engine oil in here. So that's what's gonna lubricate these bearings. So both of these bearings, both the countershaft bearing and then the bearing for the transmission on the inside here will come with double shielded bearings. I'm not sure why. This one, I pulled the shield off of the inside so that where our transmission is and our, the transmission oil will lubricate the inside of that bearing. And then on the clutch side, I left the shield here because typical of most engines, this is a one side shielded bearing. So that's the way that I'm installing it. Uh, you guys can do it that way or you can do it however you want, but that's how I'm doing it. Um, this one here, again, no shields whatsoever. We'll put our countershaft seal in place. These ones usually go in pretty easy. All right, we're good to go. Now we've got our bearing shields to put in place. If we come on the inside of our stator half, there's one that goes right here. We've got a flathead screw, and here is the shield. You're gonna put it with the tapered side facing up so that the flathead fits in there. It goes in place right here. Now it doesn't say in the service manual, but I'm going to put just a little bit of blue Loctite on these because I'm not as worried about the bearing falling out of place, but if these little shields fell out of place and were bopping around on the inside of your engine, I think you might have some problems. I'm gonna be using a JIS screwdriver that stands for Japanese Industrial Standard. It is important to use that. You, looking at the tips of the screwdrivers from a regular, you really can't tell a difference, but the Japanese industrial standard has a different bite. And if you use the correct screwdrivers, you're probably not gonna ruin any of your screws going in or coming out. We're just gonna make these good and snug. All right, that's it for the stator side. Now we'll move to the clutch side. So we've got one retainer for our main shaft bearing right here. There is a sharp side and a rounded smooth side. The smooth side goes up. Just make sure it lines up with those three holes. And again, I'm gonna put blue Loctite on these. If you look at these screws, you can actually see that there was blue Loctite on these. I don't know if that's from the factory or from the last guy that had this engine apart, but we're gonna do the same thing. Just put a little bit of blue Loctite on them. Some people are really scared to put any kind of Loctite on any of their bolts and screws on an engine build because they're afraid they're never gonna come back out. But if you just use a little bit, you'll be fine. Even if you're using red Loctite, if you just put a dot of it, very small amount, it's not gonna get seized in there. And if it does, you can always use heat and break it free. And again, with these screws, we're using the JIS screwdriver. If you don't have a set of JIS screwdrivers, you gotta get a set. If you're doing any kind of work on Japanese bikes, man, they just, they save your life. <laughs> Seriously, you don't wanna strip out the head of a screw on any of these. And again, these are just gonna get snugged down by hand. Make them good and snug. There we go. Now we've got a seal retainer that goes right here. It's another Phillips head. A little bit of blue Loctite. Then this is probably a splash shield. 
It helps direct the oil when it's sloshing around in the engine. It directs it so that it lubricates the correct parts. Okay. All right, bearings, seals, and retainers are installed. We're gonna switch case halves here and we're gonna go to our stator side so we can install the crank. Putting these in can be kind of like a daunting task at first glance, but they're really not hard to put in, but you do need a crank case installer tool. I've got one right here, it's available from Tusk. You can get these at RockyMountainATV.com. I will have this linked in the description below as well as all the tools in this video. As long as they're available, I will have them linked there. Before we put that in, it's a good time to hop around the other side and make sure that you put some uh, grease inside your crank seals. So this is a very easy tool to use. I'm gonna show you how to set it up in a second here, but the first things first, you wanna make sure that you're putting the tapered side of your crank going in to your stator side. So we're gonna take this, pop it on through our engine case. Hopefully we can get it started, yep, a little bit. And then one of the things that you wanna focus on when you're doing this is that your rod is facing upward like this where your cylinder goes. If you do this down here like so, as you pull it in, it's actually gonna get stuck. And I've done that before. We definitely don't wanna do that today. So make sure that that's up like that. Now attaching this tool is really easy. Basically we're gonna fit an adapter on the end of our crankshaft. The Tusk one comes with a couple different sizes. So no matter what crank you have, most of them are gonna work as long as it's a Japanese bike. Um, so we have our, the correct adapter here and we've got this little sleeve. We're gonna take the sleeve put it with the threaded portion facing outward, slide it over our crank. We've got our adapter here with the, um, the side on the top that looks like a nut. It's gonna to face towards you. That is going to thread on to the end of our crank. You wanna get it good and threaded on there because this is actually the anchor that we're gonna be pulling on. So if you don't have enough threads, you could actually rip them off or you could you know, gall your threads or something. So you wanna make sure that that's on there pretty far. And then when this sleeve comes up, you see now this won't come off. So now we're gonna take this threaded shaft and this will thread onto our adapter. Just make sure that's threaded all the way in. And effectively, we've attached that to the end of the crank. Now we've got our tube here and you'll see inside there's a key this little groove here. We're gonna line that up with this little peg right here. We'll slide this over top, line that up. There we go. Now we've got a nut that's gonna go on the end. Just get that started. Now we've got these two crossbars. We're gonna get these in place. Let's just get this started first. You wanna kinda of line these up some place that looks at least mildly strong. Like if there's a really thin area or like right here where your stator grommet goes, you don't want to put it there and try to make them even. Get one side. Oop, this can be kind of cumbersome. All right, so we're set up. I like to put this kind of on the edge of the bench because we're gonna putting a wrench on the end here and this way I can do full revolutions of the wrench. So we'll throw this on here. We'll get a little bit of tension on here and it's gonna start pulling the crank in. Again, you wanna take your rod, make sure it's facing upward. And as I'm tightening this down, you'll notice this gap is gonna get smaller and smaller. And sometimes they're tough. This one feels like it's gonna go in nice and easy. If it's like cracking and creaking, uh, that's normal. If it's really tough though, slow down. You might wanna take it out. You might have a problem or something. You do not wanna force it. You can see how easily this is going in. If these rods are bending, that's gonna be probably a no-no. Stop, check everything, make sure uh, this crank is not coming in crooked. You want it to come in nice and straight. You might hear it creak a little bit. Kind of hoping it does as an example. It's creaking a little bit, but not very loud. If it's, sometimes they really creak and pop and that's, that's normal because these are very tight tolerances. We're almost there. This was a really easy one. And right about there, it doesn't have to be super tight. Yep, that should be good there. Then we're gonna back this off. And we should be good to go. We can take our tool off here, spin off our nut, slide the tube off, unscrew our threaded rod, take off our adapter. Boom. 
installed. Before you move on, any kind of rotating assembly, you always wanna check as you're going. Make sure that this moves nice and smoothly. If anything's binding up, you wanna stop, Recheck your work, make sure everything is good. Anything that rotates, man. This, the transmission, just as you're going, make sure it's smooth. I'm telling you, you'll thank yourself later. Now we're about to drop the transmission in place to set up for that. I've got two two by sixes. We're gonna get these in place and put them on either side. And that will get the engine off the bench. The reason we're doing that is because when we drop the transmission through, the counter shaft is gonna come through this hole and it'll be hitting up against the bench. So this will keep it up in the air. Now, if you've got an engine stand or something like that, that's gonna make it a lot easier, but I understand that not everybody has tools like that, so no fancy tools here, just two two by sixes. Now we're about to drop the transmission into our cases. Before we do that, I wanted to mention a couple differences that you may come across. If you've got a 1985 or a 1985 and a half Tri-Z, you're gonna have a five-speed transmission. If it's a 1986, you'll have a six-speed transmission. Now, one caveat to that is that the transmissions can be swapped into different cases. So you may have an 80, a set of 85 cases with an 86 transmission, which would be a six speed and vice versa. One way to denote whether or not your cases are an 85 or an 86 are in the first three digits on the VIN number. If it says 38W, it's either an 85 or an 85 and a half. If it says 1RX, then it's an 86. One other thing I wanted to point out because this was confusing for me is that in this factory service manual, I believe this schematic of the transmission is of a YZ250. So in 19, I believe 83 and 84, they had almost identical transmissions to the Tri-Z with one small difference. And that is on our second gear pinion. You'll see they have a circlip right here. There is no circlip on the Tri-Z transmission. So that was very confusing for me. And I'll show you in a second what the transmission does look like. But if you do have that circlip on your transmission, it's possible that somebody swapped a YZ250 transmission into your Tri-Z. So if the circlip's there, don't worry about it. Just install it with that clip. It would be rare that you see that, but I did want to mention it in case somebody comes across that. But most importantly, no matter which of these transmissions you have, they're all going to be installed pretty much the same. So the transmission I have here, I believe, is a 1985 and a half. And I think this is the most common transmission in the Tri-Z. So chances are this is what you'll have. This is the second gear pinion. Uh, it can slide off. Ooh, there goes our washer. There is a beveled side, and then this one side has a raised kind of collar portion. Now, I couldn't find any information or pictures. Uh, if you look at the schematic here, it really doesn't denote. It's, it's this gear right here. Uh, which way it goes. It doesn't say anything in the text either, uh, but this is the way that it came out with the beveled portion facing inward because it can go on either way. Oh, geez. Pop that back on there. You see, you can flip it around and it will go this way too, but it, I believe it goes this way. So it goes like that. And then that washer that just fell on the ground is this one right here. It's a special washer. You can see it has those little half moons. So we're gonna go ahead and place that on like so. I've got the rounded edge facing up, but I'm not really sure that matters. And as you may have noticed, there's no clip on here. This washer and the two gears can slide off freely. And then of course, if you have a 1986, it's gonna be a six speed, which is easy to denote. You just count the amount of gears you have. One, two, three, four, five. It's either an 85 or an 85 and a half. If it's got a sixth, it's an 86. Now, regardless of which transmission you have, now is the time to take a look at it and inspect it. So the couple things that you wanna check out, you wanna look at your teeth, make sure that you don't have any broken teeth and make sure there's no major pitting or just worn out gears. Usually you can tell if something is worn out. And then you have the dogs. Those are these, these little raised portions inside. They're gonna lock the gears together. You wanna make sure that they're nice and square. You can usually tell if they're rounded out. You can see how nice and square these ones are. These ones are in really good shape. If they're not, if they're rounded out, a lot of times that's what causes gears to pop out of place. So you'll be riding and there's all this tension on there and they, they start to come apart and it'll pop out. So you wanna make sure that they're nice and square. Now's the time to replace them. You also wanna make sure that everything is put together correctly because I've definitely taken apart engines before and the transmissions have been removed and somebody put them back together in the incorrect uh, orientation. And without the correct shims and stuff, sometimes they can run uh, like okay, but they might not shift properly. Your best bet is going to be looking at a service manual. You can see they have a whole breakdown of the transmission, all the different gears. They tell you how many teeth are on each gear. So if you're afraid that they might be uh, flip-flopped or something, you can actually count the teeth and make sure it's right. They've got all the little shims and the clips. They're really not that complicated. They can be kind of daunting when you first look at them, uh, but they just kind of go together piece by piece, make sure that everything is organized properly. Luckily, this, these are good to go. And if you don't have a service manual, that's okay. You can hop on to RockyMountainATV.com. In the OEM section, they have schematics of pretty much any name brand machine that's ever been made.
These are also updated schematics. You can see in the 1985, there is indeed no circlip after the second gear pinion. And you can also take a look at the 1986 transmission diagrams if that's what you have. Before we drop the transmission in, we're gonna lubricate our bearings. We've got some Maxima assembly lube. You can use whatever uh, lubricant you like, but this stuff is really good. It's good and thick, so it kind of stays in place. Just put a little bit on our bearings. Not gonna hurt anything putting lubricant on your bearings. So this can be kind of hard to show. I'm gonna come around from the other side so that hopefully you guys can see. Now again, this is what I believe is the 85 and a half version. So we'll make sure that everything is held together. Use your fingertip to hold that little washer, the special washer on the end. And again, the orientation of this gear goes with the beveled edge facing inward and that little collar facing outward. Put our washer on there. So just hold that with the tip of your finger. A good idea, if you can't get that to stay, I'm gonna take a little bit of bearing grease and just kind of stick it around the outside here. Then we'll take that washer and put it on like so, and it should stick. So now you just kind of have to hold the gear there. So we're gonna mesh these together. We've got our, this is the output shaft right here, the counter shaft. So we're gonna mesh these together, kind of roll them and get them locked in place and put them in both at the same time. Can be a little tough. Come on, you bastard. There we go. You just wanna make sure that's bottomed out and make sure everything rolls good and smooth. Now we've got three shift forks to put in place. This one that says V3 on it. We're gonna set that one aside for now. We've got one that says 5x5-1, you can see the one right there. And then this one has 5x5 on one side and three on the other side. So three is the top one and one is the bottom one. So one will go in first. So the 5x5 with the one, and then you've got these little pins right here. And these are removable, so you wanna make sure that they're in place. Um, that will face this way. So we're gonna put this, there's little grooves in our gears. We're gonna go to the bottom one, and again, making sure that the pin is facing this way. This is another area. You wanna put a little bit of lubricant, and then we're just gonna fish this in here, and it'll fit right in the groove, like so. Just kinda of push it out to the side like that. Now the one with the three on it's gonna go in with the pin, again, facing this way. That's gonna go a little bit higher up, right, like so. And now we can take the one that says 4V3 on it, and it's gonna face with the pin facing this way, so that it's gonna face the other two forks, and it's gonna go on the other shaft. So this will go in like so. And just like with the other ones, just push it out to the side. Now we've got our shift cam right here. It does have a bearing on it, so just make sure that it rolls nice and smooth. You can go ahead and put some lubricant in all of our channels here. Now when we install this, we're gonna do it with the shift star facing upward, and it's kind of cumbersome. Basically, we're gonna take these little pins and navigate them into the grooves on the shift cam. Uh, there's no instructions denoted in the manual. It just says install the shift cam. So I'm just gonna place this in here. We're gonna have to spin it around and stuff. I tried just dropping it in, and it doesn't wanna fit. So I think we're just gonna have to play around with it a little bit. Uh, we might have to lift up the shaft just a little bit uh, to get it to work, but um, once we get everything in there, I'll show you what it looks like in the correct orientation. There we go. So that, that bottom fork is really difficult to get in there. I actually had to raise the transmission a little bit just by pushing up on the counter shaft. I don't know if it's supposed to be that hard or not, but it does go in. And we've got two shift shafts. The short one is gonna go on this side. The long one is gonna go on this side. Now I've got lubricant on these shafts. I'm just gonna slide these through and they'll pop into a little groove in the case. There's that one. And there's that one. So if you guys can see, those pins are fit into these grooves. There's the top one, goes in the top groove. And I don't know if you'll be able to see down there, but there is the little, the pin down there goes into the third groove at the bottom. And then if we come around this side, you can see 
this pin right here goes in the middle groove. Again, this is a crucial time to make sure the transmission rolls freely. And then if you, if you shift the shift drum, you'll be able to see the shift forks moving up and down. And that's actually shifting the gears. So you just wanna make sure that all that stuff is working and moving nice and freely. Now we're about ready to put our case halves together. You wanna to make sure that you're prepared before you start putting your sealant on the case because as soon as you start putting that down, it's gonna start curing, so you have a limited amount of time. Now I'm gonna be using Yamaha 6B. Uh, the manual does call for Yamaha 4. The big thing is that you have a gasket sealer that's gasoline resistant because two strokes, there is gas that goes in the crankcase. It's used to lubricate things and gas will eat away other sealants. So Yamaha 4, Yamaha Bond, Yamaha Bond 4 and Yamaha Bond 6B Either one of them will work. Realistically, you've probably got 30 or 40 minutes before the sealant will, will cure. But since this, you know, you could run into problems or something, you wanna be as prepared as possible. So I have all my case hardware set aside. I've got a stainless steel bolt kit here. Uh, so your hardware may look a little bit different. I like to use anti-seize on all of my fasteners that go in the engine, especially if they're stainless steel because they can, they can oxidize and seize in the engine cases. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put some anti-seize on all of these just on the one side, and then when you spin them in, it'll get all over the threads, and they're just ready to go so that I don't have to you know, screw around with doing this when the time comes. And then we've got our cylinder, or our, um, our dowel pins. These are mandatory, you gotta put these in. They keep everything, your case is nice and aligned. If you don't have them, definitely order them new. They're like two bucks. I usually get new ones anyways. But you wanna put anti-seize on these because if you don't do this, the next time it comes to tearing it down, likely uh, these will be seized. So if you do this, they will not be seized. And uh, if you're not the guy tearing it down, then the next guy will thank you. And the other thing you wanna do is make sure that your uh, mating surfaces are nice and clean. So you wanna take a clean rag, like this dirty old sock I have, uh, spray some lacquer thinner on it. And this will cut all of the grease and oil and stuff because we were just using assembly lubes and stuff. And just make sure that these are good and clean. Otherwise, uh, if these are dirty, the gasket sealer may not completely bond and you might end up with some leaks. So take the time now and just clean up all of the mating surfaces. Now we're gonna do both halves. And the way that I like to do this is you just kind of spread it around on all of the mating areas. And then you kind of dab it. And that gives it a little bit of a texture and a little bit of body. And it also makes the spread a little bit more even. And I typically don't have leaks almost ever. So this has proven to be a pretty good method. You don't have to go crazy thick with this stuff. If you go really thick, it's gonna ooze all over the place. That won't hurt anything, but it's gonna be really messy. Uh, but you, you don't wanna go too thin either because you don't want leaks. But just like a nice medium layer on both case halves and you should be fine. You get some of this stuff on your gears and stuff or your crank. It's not gonna hurt anything. Now we're gonna put our dowel pins in. It looks like they have four different spots where these dowel pins fit. I think you can do any one of them and it does not tell you in the service manual which ones to use. But you just wanna make sure that you're using uh, one on each side. So we're gonna pop them right in here. I'll do that one and then come over on this side. I'll pop one in. That one's a little snug. Maybe we'll go in this other one. Oh, why are these so tight? There it goes. All right, now we'll drop our other case half on. And just for reference, it's probably been about 10 or 12 minutes since I opened up the sealant. So we're gonna drop this in place. Just make sure that everything's lining up. You wanna go nice and slow, don't force anything. Our shift star, you may have to spin that to get it to fit. Mine needs to be spun just a little bit. Looks like, I don't know if we're hung up on something. Just wanna go easy with it. We can tap on this one side with a mallet, just gently. I think it's just a little bit tight on this crank. You don't wanna go hard though, because you can throw your crank out of true. All right, 
right, no problem. I think we're going to have to pull this case together. Just like we pulled the other the crankcase through, or the crankshaft through the other side, we, sometimes you have to do that on this side as well. Now for this side, my crank puller actually doesn't have a fitting for it. So I have the flat piece of steel, it's an edger blade. We're going to pop that on place. That's nice and flat. Then I'm going to take the actual nut that goes on the shaft and thread it on. I'm going to make sure you have at least a few threads on there. And then when we turn this, it should pull the cases together. Yep, it's pulling it down, no problem. Sometimes you just gotta be unconventional, man. This is working perfectly. Thinking on the fly, man. Make sure everything else is going nice and smooth. Yes, it is. And it's spinning nice and easy too, which is good. So we'll bring it down. Now we'll put all our hardware in place and I'm just gonna snug this down by hand and then we'll let it sit for about 15 minutes and in that time when it's drying, the sealant will kind of get a little bit of body to it and then we'll come back in and we'll torque it down. All right, it's been about 15 minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and torque our bolts down. The manual calls for nine foot pounds, which I think is a little heavy. I'm gonna go to seven foot pounds you want to go in a crisscross pattern as you're doing this. If you're using a torque wrench for the first time, you want to make sure that you're gripping it at the handle because if you grip anywhere else, you're actually changing the leverage and you won't get an accurate torque. All right, so these are all torqued down. There are nine bolts. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You don't want to forget there are three inside the stator housing. Now that we've got this all torqued down, you want to make sure that everything rolls nice and smooth. Crank feels good. Sometimes your crank might be a little bit tight. If it's just a little bit tight, uh, the new crank seals can be really tight. This one rolls really nice and smooth, but that's just something to be aware of if it feels a little bit like a little bit of friction. As long as it's smooth, it's probably okay. Uh, we'll check our transmission. Oh yeah, nice and smooth, man. You guys can see that's good to go, man. Now the extra sealant that oozed between the cases, I like to clean that off. I used to take a, a rag with lacquer thinner and wipe it away right away and it would smear and get all over the place and it would take forever to clean off. So the best way to do it is to let it dry and then you scratch away with the fingernail. It practically just peels away. Makes it way easier. So it's actually pretty late. So I'm gonna call it a night. We'll let this cure overnight and we'll do it in the morning. But for now, the cases are complete. All right guys, it's the next day and our sealant is good and dry. The best tool for this is the good old fingernail. We're just gonna come in here. You can see the stuff just scratches right away. Sometimes when it gets peeling up, you can even grab onto it and it'll just peel right off. Not all the time, but it's really, really easy to do this way. So I'm just gonna go around the cases and get to scratching. All right, let's get started on the clutch side of the engine. We're gonna start with our shift mechanism. We've got a shift detent here, a return spring, and then a small bolt. And it's a special bolt, you'll see, there's a little raised portion here. It's like a little collar. That is gonna go on the inside of your detent, like that. And you wanna make sure the flat portion of your detent is in this orientation. I'm gonna put a little bit of blue Loctite on our bolt. Usually things under spring tension are not gonna back out, but this is just a little bit of safety. So put a return spring in there. You can see the little foot down here. It gets uh, captured in the case. I'm gonna lift it up just a little bit and we're gonna see if we can kind of walk it in with the bolt. Again, with the flat portion of the detent facing the back. Let me just see if I can get this bolt started. My apologies if my hands are in the way here, guys. Uh, can we get her in there? All right, it's started. And now I'm just gonna slowly walk this in. And as we get tighter and tighter, we'll make sure that everything lines up. Just wanna make sure that the, that raised portion of the bolt goes in the detent and it's not uh, pushing up against the side. Just come in here. And I'm just gently using a flathead to Kind of get there because it snapped into place. 
And as we get closer here, I'll move the detent because you don't want to bend the detent. Oh, it's not going to be as bad as I thought. So get that detent in place and you'll see um, as we drive this in, the spring will probably fall into place. I'm, just, I'm going to monitor this, that it's not out on the edge like that or anything like that. So I'll just take my finger like that and we're just going to drive this in nice and slow. And just rip, as you're doing this, just make sure nothing is like bending or binding up because you could bend the detent. All right, we're getting pretty close here. Let's see if I can get my spring where it's supposed to be. Just slowly walking this in. I don't see a torque spec for this in the service manual. It's an eight millimeter bolt. I'm gonna go to seven foot pounds. Good to go. Now I'm gonna put the shift shaft in place. It's a good time to inspect this, make sure it's good and straight. If this is bent, uh, you're gonna have hard shifting. You also wanna inspect your splines. So you can take a good look at these. Uh, I actually missed on this one. You, you may not be able to tell on camera because these aren't that bad, but this, this one should really be replaced. There's a couple flat splines. I, I don't know if you guys will be able to see that. I think they'll be okay. There's still a good bit, bit of bite on them. Uh, if I wasn't trying to finish this video, I would order a new one. This is still available. They're only 35 bucks from Rocky Mountain ATV. Definitely worth replacing, but it's not that hard to replace. Uh, so I'm gonna finish out the video with this one and I think it'll be okay. I can always swap this out, uh, but definitely if you can inspect that beforehand and even if there's just a little bit of wear, it's worth replacing these. So we're gonna take a little bit of assembly lube, throw it on the shaft here before we throw it in. And don't forget on the other side of the engine, there is an oil seal. It's always good to replace that because you don't want, this is like a common spot on the other side um, that you get oil leaks. Ain't nobody got time for that. So we're gonna pop this in place. Boom, and you'll see there's a little peg here because between these two, the legs of the spring, if I bring this back out, we're gonna push that in and it'll pop right over that spring. And then these two little claws are gonna catch on our shift star. If you've ever done a Banshee, it's very similar to that. I'm just gonna get this to pop in, there we go. And now that's set in place, and these little arms, when this is shifted up and down, will catch the little things on our shift star, the little pegs. Before we go any further, I'm gonna put the shifter on the other side, and we're gonna test the transmission function. When you're putting your shifter on, just be careful. If you're pushing, it will pop out off, off the other side. So just kind of keep your hand on the other side, make sure it doesn't push through. Okay, so now I can manipulate the shift changer from the other side. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna run through the, the gears. Uh, how we're gonna do that, you wanna be spinning either your main shaft here or on the other side, your counter shaft. Sometimes you have to spin one or the other and it just, it can be difficult. Sometimes it feels like the transmission doesn't wanna shift. That's totally normal when it's on the bench. Once the engine's running and it's at full RPM and stuff, it'll shift just fine. Though the big thing is just making sure that it actually engages into the gears and you don't have anything getting hung up or it just won't go into a gear. So make sure our uh, shift changer is all the way in there. And what we're gonna do right now, we're in neutral. So to test neutral, you've got um, your main shaft and your output shaft. Uh, you should be able to spin one of these and hold the other one. And that's how you know that neutral is working. If this one's fighting you, something's not right, it's not going into neutral, but our neutral is good. So now we'll check first gear. So I'm just gonna spin our transmission and shift down. Okay, so now we're in first gear and I'll show you See, as I spin the output shaft, the main shaft is spinning. And if I hold this one, I can't spin it. So we know we're not neutral. First gear is working good. And now I'm just gonna go and shift up. We're gonna go, it should be second gear. Click right into place. Third gear. Oh, did it pop back a second? I think we're in third. Fourth, fifth and now it won't go up anymore. So all of our transmission gears are good. You definitely want to test this now. Now we're gonna install the kicker idler gear. Just an FYI, if you look in the Yamaha service manual, they have this gear going on the main shaft, which is obviously incorrect. It goes on the shaft back here. Uh, just something to be aware of. It can be kind of confusing if you're using that manual. Anyways, we have two washers, these little skinny washers. We'll put one in place, put a little bit of assembly lube on our shaft. We've got the gear goes in place. We've got another skinny washer. It's just like the one in the back. 
put that in place. And then there is a C-clip. Usually the manual rec will recommend putting a new C-clip on. They're really cheap, it's good insurance. I recommend that also. Have I reused them? Yes, in fact, I'm reusing this one right here. <laughs> as long as they're not like warped and they still have a good bit of spring, you're probably okay. It's just a good rule of thumb to replace these. I forgot to order one and I don't feel like waiting. So you just wanna make sure that that snaps in though. I don't know if you heard that guy, they uh, kind of clipped into the little groove. That's the main thing and like I said, if you're gonna reuse one of these, just make sure it's got good spring tension and like it's not wiggling around or anything once it's on there. That one should be good to go. Now we'll move on to our primary drive gear. That's gonna go up front here. First, we have a collar that goes in place. You can see there is a thinner portion that will face outward. And you wanna make sure, double check that you greased your the inner lip of your crank seal. You put a little bit of lubricant on here. Uh, you gotta be careful putting these in place because it's really easy to roll the inner lip of this seal. So usually, when, you, when I'm doing these, I'll kind of spin as I'm going in and just keep an eye on the seal. You wanna check that the lip doesn't roll. And I think we're good on this one. It's easy to tell. You can see the edge of the lip, if it rolled or not. All right, I think that's all the way in there. Just double checking that we didn't roll the seal. If it does roll, it's no big deal. You just pull it back out usually and it'll kind of like un unroll the lip of that seal. Now we've got the gear itself. This is, there's no special orientation for this in terms of the grooves, the splines, uh, but it does go with this little sunken portion facing outward and this little raised portion facing inward. Just line those teeth up, pops into place. And we've got a lock nut that goes on top here. The manual does not call for Loctite on here, but I do not want this backing off. And this is a lock nut, yes but it never hurts to just put a little bit of red Loctite, just a little bit. Uh, this red Loctite from Amazon, it's pretty good because it's not as strong as the name brands, but it, it's stronger than like a blue Loctite. So it's a nice in-between. I like to use that stuff. I'm just gonna spin this in place. You can feel the lock nut getting tight right there where it doesn't wanna spin by hand. I'm gonna leave that there for now because we're gonna come back and tighten that later. Now we'll put our kicker gear in place. Typically this is not going to be disassembled. They usually come out as a unit and go back in as a unit, but just in case yours is disassembled, we'll build it together. Here is the main gear. Again, check your teeth and stuff. I don't know if the Tri-Z is a machine that's prone to have these worn out, but there's some machines where these get worn out and then your kicker's slipping and stuff. So anyways, we'll put this in place. Here's our shaft. This will go on. The orientation doesn't matter right now. And you'll see it's kind of got the uh, spherical spines, splines, spins on like that. We'll just put that in place. We've got a big washer that's gonna go in place like that. And we've got a spring and you'll see there's a tang right here. That tang is gonna go in this little hole right here. So we'll slide this in place, get that hole in the tang or the tang in the hole. Then we've got this um, plastic bushing. This is going to go in and this little groove right here is gonna snap on to the tang in our gear there or our uh, spring. So we'll push this in place Make sure it is lined up. There it goes, clipped into place. And you can see it is clipped on there. So now the spring is captured and this unit can't come apart. That's why this is usually, usually people don't take that apart unless like the gear is bad or something. Then we have the uh, front gear, goes on like so, slides in place. And then there's a washer that goes on top and there is your kicker assembly. Now we're gonna go ahead and install this. Uh, it's something to keep in mind, this little tang on the back of your gear, it does spin. So if you're not getting it lined up right, just keep that in mind, you can move that to where it needs to go. Now that tang will be going in this little compartment right here. It gets captured in there, and then you can see this stopping portion, this flat portion here, that is where the stopper will be going up against. So we're gonna spin this around, and I'm actually gonna take my gear and my washer off, or, off here, just so they don't, they don't fall off. And we're gonna orient this so that that tang goes in that groove. Now I'm gonna put the gear in place, our washer, and then we'll take the spring, pair of needle nose pliers, and we'll just spin this around and put it in that hole right there, and that is where it will stay. Now typically I would hook up the Kickstarter and just 
do a test function, make sure this is working. Unfortunately, we can't do that on the Tri-Z because uh, there's actually a second gear that's gonna go out here and it reverses the direction of the kick so that we can kick forward. Uh, now, because of that, there's no splines on it, so we can't hook up the Kickstarter. That's okay, though. Um, I'm gonna take my clutch removal tool, and this will hold the gears, and we'll be able to give it a test kick this way. You can see that gear comes out and then engages with the idler gear, and then that will turn the clutch basket, and then that will turn the crankshaft over. So it's functioning properly. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and put our clutch basket in place. Uh, chances are your basket will not look like this. This is an aftermarket billet basket by Talon. I will have this linked in the description below. It's pretty pricey, it's like 500 bucks, but they're the only option and as far as replacements, at least from what I, what I could find. So you'll probably have a regular aluminum basket. You wanna check the fingers and make sure that they're not grooved. If these are rough and grooved, that's gonna affect your, your, the function of your clutch. Uh, anyways, so that's why that one looks like that. We'll go ahead and we've got a nice thick washer that's gonna go in place here on your main shaft. Now we'll put some lubricant. Then we've got a bushing that goes in place. Then we'll put a little bit more lube on the bushing. Then the basket goes in place. You may have to rotate this because you've got gears back here and they have to mesh together with the idler gear as well as your primary drive gear. There it goes, popped into place, no problem. And we've got another thick washer. It's just like the one in the back, can't mix them up. That goes in place right there. Then we've got the inner hub. Same thing with this. Uh, you want to inspect this. You can see there are, you can see the little wear marks. This one feels good though. They still feel smooth, so that's okay. Otherwise you might want to replace that. This has to mesh up with the splines. There we go. Pop that into place. And we've got a locking washer right here. Now I don't use these locking tabs. I use red Loctite. I've never had a problem with them backing off. They're a pain in the ass putting them on and taking them off. Um, but if you are gonna use this method, they do recommend that you, that you use a new one of these every time. However, you'll see there's three tabs. It looks like this one has been used twice. As long as you have a new tab, you should be okay. You put this in place and then once the nut is on there, that tab gets folded over and it makes it so that the nut can't come off. But again, I use red Loctite. I've never had a problem. So this will go in place. I'm basically just putting it on here for the function of the washer. Otherwise I wouldn't even run it. And then we're gonna use our red Loctite in here. You put a fair amount on the clutch. And then we've got a nut that goes in place. Now this nut gets tightened down to 54 foot pounds. As long as you've got one of these clutch holder tools, this job is a breeze. I highly recommend these things. They're like 15 bucks on your Rocky Mountain ATV and I use them for a lot of stuff. Anyways, uh, first thing we wanna do is get this engine flat. It's just gonna make it a little bit easier. Then we're gonna come in here with our, t our clutch tool and it's gonna grab onto this inner hub with these teeth. This does not need to be tight. It works like a vice grip, but you're, we're not worried about gripping down this way it's keeping it from spinning. So we just wanna keep it nice and loose. That should be good right there. And then we're gonna use the bench in our favor. So I've got the, um, the tool actually resting against the bench and then we'll, we'll be turning on this nut. Now my nut is a little jimmied up so I just wanna make sure that the socket's all the way on there before we start wrenching on this thing. I think we're good now. Torque wrench is set to 54 foot pounds. And now you barely have to do anything because we're up against the bench here. We're just gonna go down. Again, making sure that we're gripping the torque uh, wrench at the handle. There we go, it's 54 foot pounds. Might have to wiggle this thing off. There we go. Take off our torque, or uh, clutch tool. Boom, no problem. Now is when you'd come in and bend these tabs down. Usually I'll come in with a channel lock and you grip it like so, and then you, you pull against the nut. And as you squeeze, it'll bend that tab right up. Like I said though, that's just something that I don't typically do. The red Loctite seems to hold them just fine. I've never had one of these back off. Now we're gonna tighten down the primary drive gear nut. The service manual doesn't give you any instructions at all. It literally just says tight to tighten the nut to 85 foot pounds. So this will spin if we try to tighten it. There's a couple different methods uh, that we can use. Uh, we have the, what's called the penny trick or I like to call it the aluminum nail trick. So this is just a little aluminum nail. And what we're gonna do, or what we would do, we're actually not gonna use this method, is you wedge it 
in between the gears and then that will stop this from spinning. So when you try to turn this gear, that nail will hold that from spinning. So there's that method. The method I wanna use though is where you hold the crank in position. You can see the crank can only go so far. Now, sometimes it goes right up against the case and you can put a bar across here, but uh, this is bottom dead center and we've got a little bit of a gap. So we're gonna make a tool for this and we're actually gonna make it together. We're just gonna take a two by four. If you don't have the studs in place, it's a lot easier. But since we've got the studs in there, you can see this two by four fits in there perfectly. Basically, we're gonna put the two by four we're gonna cut a slot in this for the rod and we'll put the two by four in there. Then we'll be able to put a rod through this and the two by four will hold it up. This will be a pretty basic tool and I'll be able to reuse it. So we're just gonna cut a slot for the rod to fit. Doesn't have to be perfect. I should be able to rip this right out. You want to make sure you have all the wood chips and stuff off of this so that it doesn't fall into your crank. Now just make sure the crank is on the correct downstroke so that when we're turning this way, the crank is in the front. Then we'll take our board. I had to open this up just a little bit more. I will take this, put it in place. I've got a shaft from a jack. That'll go right there. And now this crank can't turn. Now again, we're going to 85 foot pounds here. That's a good bit of torque. So this is a time where if you have a buddy to hold the engine or if it's in the frame, it's gonna be a lot easier because it can be a little cumbersome getting this much torque on a, on a nut without the engine moving around. So I'm just going to use my body weight here and uh, hopefully we can get the job done. All right, there we go. Not too bad. Now we'll just roll the crank back, remove the rod, Take your board off and we're good to go. Uh, one thing I did skip though, you probably should put a rag or something in here just to make sure you keep sawdust and stuff out of your crank. Next thing we're gonna do is build a clutch pack. The cleanest way that I found to do it is with either a paper plate or a plastic plate like this one. And we'll take our fibers, put them in the plate, crack open our oil, and we will soak them right in the plate. You don't have to do this overnight. Some people say like, oh, you gotta do it for 24 hours and stuff like that. I don't really think that's the case. You know, we're not gonna be starting this engine up immediately. So putting the oil on the fibers and then putting it in the engine, it's gonna be, in our, in our case, a few days before it starts up because we still have to put the engine in the, in the, in the machine and all. Um, but there's gonna be some time for that oil to soak in is what I'm trying to say. So we're just gonna pour some oil on the plates. Doesn't have to be a crazy amount. And I'll just move these around, make sure that they're all good and lubricated. You can see, even just doing that little bit, they're kind of all over everything as it is. And the oil that I'm going to be using for this build is Maxima MTL Extra Light. It's a 75 weight. Uh, it's good for two stroke and four stroke. I have yet to use this. So I like to try different oils and see what I like best. Uh, Maxima is a really good name. So I don't think we'll have any problems. Now we'll start putting these in our basket. This usually wants to leak a little bit down the bottom. So just to keep things clean, put this uh, paper towel down here. So we've got the fibers and we've got our uh, steels right here. Now on the steels, you're gonna have a sharp edge and a rounded edge. Now, I don't really think it matters which way they go, but most people like to put them one way or the other. So I'm gonna go with the sharp edge facing out just to keep everything consistent. We're gonna start with a fiber. Just get all of the oil all over the fibers and we'll fit that into our basket. Next goes a steel. Make sure we got that sharp edge facing outward. And we're just gonna go back and forth until the pack is built. Another fiber. Now before we move on, we're gonna come around to the other side of the engine and we're gonna put our clutch actuation arm in. So that's this arm right here. We'll make sure we have some grease on our inner lip of our seal. And I also wanna make sure we have some assembly lube on our bearing in there. So we've got a washer that goes here and then there's gonna be a spring on here. You'll notice this one end of the spring is bigger and has like more of a square notch and the other one's like a rounded notch. The square portion goes down and the catch is right here. So we can actually set that like so. And the actuation arm will literally just drop in place. You can see it's kind of like a D shape. You wanna put it in this way. There we go. We wanna take our spring here. We're gonna pull it around to the other side. 
so that the catch is up there. So it's got spring tension pulling it back. And that's all we need to do there. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead and put the pressure plate on. Before you put it on, inspect the contact area that's gonna meet with this top fiber. You wanna make sure it's not grooved or has any damage or anything like that. If it does have that, you wanna replace it. Uh, before we put that on, we've got the clutch pusher. This has an adjustable clutch pusher. This is two pieces right here. This is actually a set screw that's adjustable and that will adjust our clutch free play. So we're not gonna worry about the free play right now, but we will put it in this hole in the back of our pressure plate. And then it comes through on the other side. And believe it or not, there's a lock washer. That's from the factory. Goes right on top and then a jam nut. And we're just gonna loosely spin this on top. Because we will be adjusting that later. So for now, I'm not too worried about it. All right, now I've got the push rod. This can go in either way. You wanna put some lubricant on it before you put it in. This will pop right in place. And you do wanna make sure that this is good and straight. If it's bent or something, you wanna replace that. That's just gonna go right in there. And then we've got a ball. Put some lubricant on that and that's gonna go on top. Now we can put the pressure plate in place. Before we put this on, there's little arrows, three of them, on this inner hub. And then there's arrows on the pressure plate as well. You wanna make sure that those arrows line up. All you have to do is line up one of them and the other ones are gonna line up as well. So we'll line that up, pop it in place, and it'll sit nice and flush up against your fiber. You can see it's making contact with that top fiber. I'm gonna show you if we do it the wrong way. Let's put it so it's not lined up. It won't sit flush. You can see the gap right there. That's how you know you didn't do it right. People put it together the wrong way like all the time though. So <laughs> make sure you line up the arrows and you're good and flush. Now we'll put our clutch springs in place. These are brand new EBC clutch springs. They're 15% stiffer than stock. We're gonna be making a little bit more power with this engine than stock. So I felt that would help out with the clutching a little bit. And then you wanna use the OEM bolts for these. If you use the wrong bolt, it can mess up your clutch or you can strip out the little, the little fingers in there that these screw into. They're very fragile and you don't need Loctite on these either. Um, but we're just gonna use this impact to get them started and run them in, but we're not gonna tighten it down with this. If you're a noob, don't use one of these impacts because you can very easily snap those things off and then you gotta get a new clutch pack or a new inner hub anyways. So this is the way to go. These things are awesome. These Milwaukee, it's an M12. Uh, they have adjustments on top. Number one is like three or four foot pounds. It's almost nothing, but it makes doing jobs like this really easy. I have it on number two because it goes a little bit quicker, but I'm also used to this tool. But if you put it on that number one, it can really save somebody that's like inexperienced. So we're just gonna wait till they bottom out. Boom. Okay. We're gonna torque these down to seven foot pounds, but when, if, we, if we go to tighten that, the whole clutch assembly is gonna to wanna to roll. So that trick I was talking about earlier with the little aluminum nail, we're gonna wedge that in the gear. That's gonna prevent the clutch from spinning. Now I'll go around and tighten these down. Again, we're going to seven foot pounds. Not very tight. We'll go in a crisscross pattern as well. And I'm just gonna go around and make sure they're all good. Perfect. And do not forget to remove your nail because I have forgotten to remove these before and then I'm wondering why the engine won't turn over. Now one last thing, we have to adjust our clutch free play. It's an easy task to do. It can be kind of hard to show on camera. So I'm gonna do my best here. So what we're gonna be adjusting is the clutch actuation arm. Now where this engages is where it stops. So the, the little bit of spring right here is from this external spring but when it actually engages that, that, that push rod and the ball bearing that we put in is where it stops. And it's right here, which is way too far forward. According to the manual, they want this arm to line up with this little, there's a marker on the case. They want that to be uh, right, up, right, right flush with that. So that's where it needs to stop. And you can see we're way out here. We're way off. Now adjusting that is really easy. If you guys remember that little threaded set screw on the front of our pressure plate, 
I'm gonna come in here with a Phillips head. You wanna make sure it's a JIS because you don't wanna strip that out. Now I'm gonna push this in to where it's maxed out. And now you'll see as I turn this, this I'm turning the screwdriver and you'll see the clutch arm is moving back. So we're just gonna spin this in until it's right up against that marker on the case. Getting close, right about there is where they want it. And then I like to go just a little bit beyond where they want it in the service manual. So right about there is where we'll go. And then once we're adjusted, we're gonna tighten down our jam, our jam nut. So we'll hold that Phillips head and then thread in the 10 millimeter nut. You wanna do your best not to spin the set screw or you might lose your adjustment, but we're gonna double check. And you wanna make sure that this is pretty good and snug because uh, you don't want this coming loose in the engine because then your, your clutch just won't work. I've had that happen before. All right, that's pretty tight. Once that's tight, we'll come around to the actuation arm again and just pull it into where it stops and just make sure that it's adjusted properly. This one looks like it's good to go. About ready to put our clutch cover on. I'll give you guys a look at this cover. It's really common on the Tri-Z that the back portion of this case snaps off. This one is repaired. You can see the repair on the inside. Uh, there was a nice bead of weld on the outside as well. I cleaned that up and then I had this powder coated in a texture black to kind of hide the imperfections. But that's really common. If you can find one of these used on eBay or something with, that is not cracked or damaged, they go for around 500 bucks. They're really rare and they're really expensive. So let's set this up. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with something easy. We've got a weep hole here for our oil. Uh, from the factory, you're just gonna have a regular Phillips head, uh, kind of a bad uh, setup in my opinion. Those Phillips heads, they strip, they strip out. So I've upgraded to a Phillips head that is also a hex head, a 10 millimeter. And we're gonna put a brand new copper uh, crush washer on there. Get that in place. I'm gonna put a little bit of anti-seize on our bolt, just a little bit. Oh, well, kind of a lot, but that's okay. Get this in place. I'm just gonna make that good and snug. That should be good. Now we've got a water pump seal that's gonna go in place here. Service manual, again, it just says to put it in place with the side that says water side facing upward, but they don't uh, indicate exactly how you're supposed to put it in there or anything, so. Uh, we'll get it in there though. We're gonna get put a little bit of grease on the outside of our seal. I'm gonna put a little bit in the case as well. Sometimes these things can be stubborn. I've never done a Tri-Z one before, but uh, some Banshee ones. Well, this one actually feels like it may push in by hand. It's pretty close anyways. Yeah, it's almost all the way down. We'll take a socket that's just a bit smaller than the seal. Seems to have pushed it nice and flush. Now I've got a brand new OEM impeller. We're gonna put this in place. Make sure that you've got a little bit of lubricant on the impeller shaft. And we're just gonna gently push this into our seal, making sure not to roll the lip. It's a pretty tight seal. That'll go in like so. And we're gonna come around the other side. We've got this thin wide washer that's gonna go in place. Then we've got a little peg that's gonna go in the impeller shaft. Then we've got another plastic gear. You can see there's a little uh, groove in there for that shaft to fit in. Then we have a smaller thin washer that's gonna go on top. And then there's an E-clip that will go in place here. And I'll use a channel lock to just clip that in place. Make sure it's in the groove. You do not want that falling off. About ready to put that cover in place. I'm gonna remove this paper towel and I'm gonna roll the clutch assembly to the other side because all of the oil has probably worked its way towards the bottom of this clutch. And I'm just doing my best not to get any drips while we're putting the clutch cover on. Got two dowel pins to put in place, putting some anti-seize on them. Got one that goes up front and one that goes in the back. We've got a brand new gasket right here. I always recommend using a name brand gasket or an OEM gasket. Using cheap gaskets is just a pain in the ass, man. It just never works out. So we're gonna go ahead and grease this. This is the method that I like to use. If you grease the gaskets, it keeps them in good shape. Uh, it has a sealing effect. It also will help when it comes time to tear the engine down. The gaskets will usually just peel right away. You don't have to worry about uh, you know, scraping the gasket off. It's 
which is always a huge pain in the ass. All right, now we'll get our gasket in place, hang it on those dowel pins. There we go. Now we'll put our clutch cover in place. I did surface this thing and it was pretty bad. It was really out of whack, probably because it's a repaired case. But it surfaced and it is good and flat now. Just have to spin our water pump gear probably to get it to line up, mesh up with the gears inside. There we go. You wanna make sure that case is seated flush before you start threading in any bolts because uh, it could be hanging up on a gear or something. Now I'll go around and thread all of our hardware in. Uh, the way that I figure out where everything goes without, if you're unorganized or if, you, if it was like a basket case or something, is by starting all of the bolts and seeing how far they stick out. So like if you put the wrong one in, you can see how far that sticks out. You want them all to stick out about the same uh, distance. And uh, that's just like a good rule of thumb to figure out where everything goes. And there is a bolt that goes inside here. You don't want to forget this one. And I'm gonna run these all in by hand, kind of going in a crisscross pattern. And then I'll do the same thing with the torque wrench. And we're gonna torque these down to five and a half foot pounds. And I'm gonna go in a crisscross pattern. These do not need to be tight. We're almost there. We've got two little dowel pins to go for our water pump cover. I've got a little bit of anti-seize on there. And then we've got a gasket, same as our clutch cover gasket. I'm gonna grease this up. We'll hang this on our dowel pins. Now we can pop our cover in place. We've got three bolts. And this bottom one gets a new copper washer. And these will get torqued to five and a half foot pounds as well. The last piece of our clutch cover is going to be our second kicker gear. This is what's going to reverse the kick so that it can kick forward. Now, I do have some damage to my case here. This is where it was repaired. So typically putting this together, we would do the grease method, but because of that little bit of damage, I am going to put some Yama Bond on here, just a little bit of RTV sealant, just so that we don't have any leaks as an extra measure. But if you don't have any damage here, I would just do the regular old uh, grease method with the gasket. Here is the cover. Got a, an oil seal on here. Just gonna put a little bit of grease in here. Then we'll pop our kicker shaft through. And then there's a thin washer that's gonna go on this side of the shaft. I'm gonna put a little bit of grease on there because I don't want the washer to fall off and fall into our engine when we're installing it. Put my Yama Bond on here. And we've got two dowel pins, again, with some anti-seize on these. Pop them in place. Looks like the gear is actually bigger than the gasket. So we're gonna have to put the gear in first. Now we'll put the gasket in place. And then our cover. Throw our hardware in here. Now for now, I'm just gonna snug these down. If we had just used the grease on that gasket, we would come back in and torque these down to five and a half foot pounds. I'm gonna let the uh, sealant firm up a little bit and then I'll come back and torque them later. All right, I can come in here, torque this down to five and a half foot pounds. And with luck, that should never leak. Good luck to the guy that has to take that off. Probably me. And last but not least for the clutch side is the oil fill plug. Got a new gasket on there with a little bit of grease. Just snug that down by hand. And of course we gotta throw the kicker on here and just make sure that everything rolls over nice and smoothly still. Oh yeah, nice and smooth. So our clutch side is done.
Now we're gonna move into the top end. This is my cylinder here. Your cylinder may look a little bit different. Mine is vapor blasted. So originally these cylinders are usually black. I've also got a brand new sleeve in here. We're going, going to be going to factory bore. If your ports look a little bit different than mine, that's because I did port this cylinder. But nevertheless, it's still going to install exactly the same as a completely stock one. So before we even do that, we're gonna check our ring end gap. And what that is, so we're gonna take our piston rings and we need to make sure that we have the adequate distance between the end of our rings when they're in the cylinder. So we're gonna check that now. Now I'm using a Wiseco piston and rings. Typically, no matter what kind of piston you have, there's gonna be a little marking on one side of the piston ring. You'll see this side is blank. You wanna put that marking upward. Now that's not critical for checking your ring gap, but I just like to do that as a rule of thumb. We're gonna put the ring in our cylinder. And then we're gonna come up from the bottom with our piston, and this is gonna make that ring nice and even in the cylinder. We'll just push this up until the ring is nice and flat. And that tiny little gap in between our ring is what we need to measure. Now, if you're gonna go by the service manual, they have the specs right here. The manual calls for 0.35 to 0.5 millimeters or 14 to 20 thousandths of an inch. Now, a typical rule of thumb for ring end gap is that for every inch of bore in diameter, you can add about four thousandths inch for the ring gap. So our cylinder here, the diameter, it's a little bit bigger than two and a half inches. It's like two and five eighths inches. So two and a half inches, that would be, uh, one inch would be four thousandths, two inches would be eight thousandths, and then another half inch would be 10 thousandths, plus it was a little bit more. So I'd probably go to 10 to 12 thousandths. Uh, so the spec in the book is 14 thousandths. So it's pretty close. Uh, what I'm gonna do is we'll get this feeler gauge. This is a great tool to have. It basically has a whole bunch of thin little shims in here, and they're all labeled. And what's nice about this one is that it has metric and standard. So you see it has 14 thousandths of an inch or 0.356 millimeters. So this is pretty much the minimum that you would wanna go if you're gonna go by the manual. I'm gonna come in nice and close here. You can see it fits in between that gap, no problem. If there's a little bit of drag, that means you're at the bare minimum. We'll pull this ring out and check the second one. And same deal, this one is good to go. If your ring end gap is too big, that's better than having it too small. If it's too small, you can actually take a file and open up your ring end gap, just be very careful. That's very rare, especially if you have a piston that's matched to your bore. They're, they're usually gonna be okay, especially if you get a name brand piston. If it's too big, you're probably gonna be okay if it's a little bit outside of spec. You're just gonna lose a little, a little bit of performance, but it's not gonna be dangerous to run. Whereas, like I said, if it's too tight, they're gonna butt up and that's gonna cause engine damage. Now that we've checked our ring end gap, we're gonna go ahead and put the rings in the piston grooves. So if you look at the piston groove, you'll see there's little stoppers. There's one right here and one right here. So that is where the ring ends will go. And again, the rings go with the marking facing upward. See that little N on there? That will face upward. And how I like to do these is you go to the little stopper Put the ring in the groove like that, lift the other end up top, and just kind of walk the piston ring on. And you want to try to not scratch the top of your piston, but if you do, it's not the end of the world. So that one is in there, and then we'll just spin this. Come on. So that it's right where that little peg is, the little stopper. Same thing with the top one marking on top. Both of these rings are the same too, so you can't mix them up. All right, rings are installed. Now for the piston clips, I think it's easier to do one of these on the bench first. So there's an opening. You wanna make sure that that's either facing downwards or upwards. That's just a rule of thumb. It, kind of ensures that they won't fall out under centrifugal force. Uh, the amount of force that these engines create can actually compress these things and make them fall out. So if you have it at the top or the bottom, chances are that won't happen. We're gonna push this into the groove with a little flathead screwdriver. All right, this one's clipped in. I'm gonna make sure that it is clipped in that little groove 
It's really important. And before we put the piston on here, we're gonna stuff the crankcase just so that when we're putting that second clip in, in case it falls out, we don't want it falling into the crankcase because that would be a major pain in the ass. We're gonna take some two stroke oil and put it on our pin. Just lube this up real good. We put a new wrist pin bearing in here. You definitely wanna put a new one of these in here if you're reusing components. This is one component you don't wanna reuse. Get it good and lubricated. Then our piston's gonna go in. This will go in with the little arrow on top of the piston facing forward. That goes towards the exhaust. If your piston doesn't have any indicators on it, these port windows go towards the intake, which is the back side of the cylinder. So we wanna make sure that that's oriented correctly because people do put these in incorrectly and the engine can run in the incorrect orientation, but uh, it, won't, it will not run correctly. Slide this piston in place. You just gotta get it to line up with the bearing and push the pin through. Okay. All right, now for the fun part, get this other clip in place. These things can be a real pain in the ass. And uh, just food for thought, it's a good idea to wear eye protection because these things are like little springs and they're under some tension. And uh, I've had these things fly out and damn near hit me straight in the eye. So just something to think about. There we go, gotcha. And we're just gonna go around and make sure this is completely seated in its groove. That looks good. All right, now we can get this rag out of here. Our old dirty sock. We've got two cylinder dowels to put in place. Put a little bit of anti-seize on these. Got one in the front and one in the back. We've got a fresh base gasket, just like with all the other gaskets. Going to coat this with grease. And in case you're just hopping in at this portion of the video, the reason I'm doing this is because it's a, it adds a sealing effect for the gasket and it also makes teardown a lot easier. When it comes time to remove this gasket, it'll probably peel just, it'll, it usually just peels right away instead of having to scrape and do all that bullshit. I'm gonna make sure you place this correctly. Get this over the gasket. Uh, it's okay if you get a little bit of grease on the gasket or the piston rather. Slide this down over our dowel pins. That's in place. We're ready to drop the cylinder in place. Make sure that the piston rings are lined up properly with your little stays. We're gonna take whatever two-stroke oil of your choice and just get it all over the piston, the, the skirts and everything, sidewalls. Make sure it's good and lubricated. You don't want the engine to start up dry. The more the merrier. You can't use too much of this stuff. Well, I guess you could, but you know what I'm saying. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the inside of the cylinder. Just get it all over the cylinder walls. All right, now we'll come down here and we'll com we're gonna compress the, the piston rings with our fingers and then just slide the cylinder in place. Take your time. Uh, sometimes it's not as easy as this. You gotta remember that this is what I do for a living. So just take your time, don't force anything. We're just lined up with our studs. There we go, nice and flat. We've got our cylinder base bolts, there's four of them. I like to put just a little bit of blue Loctite on these, just a tiny little bit. Throw these in place. If you guys are wondering why all of my hardware looks brand new, these are all, this is all the original hardware from 1985. Uh, I have all my stuff vapor blasted and zinc plated by Moto Blast. Guy does excellent work. If you do choose to use them, make sure you let him know I sent you. And on this front stud, there is a spring stay for your exhaust springs. I forgot to mention that in the video, but it goes right underneath this base nut. And I'm just gonna snug these down by hand first, and then we'll come in and tighten them down. If you want, you can wait until the engine is mounted in your frame. It makes it a little bit easier to tighten these because right now the engine's kind of moving all over the place. If you wanna do it on the bench, we can do it the way that I'll do right now. I call it the swing arm bolt method. So basically, we're gonna tighten these down to 25 foot pounds. And we have a nice um, half inch extension here. 
You put it through, actually, this one's not gonna work. We have a nice 3 8 inch extension. Just slide it through where the swing arm bolt goes, and that's just gonna give you leverage to keep the engine from twisting. So now, you can hop on here. We've got our torque wrench set to 25 foot-pounds. Uh, it looks like I need a deep well. Get our socket on there. And now you can hold on to your, the, uh, the extension while tightening this. Makes it really, really easy. And you don't even need a buddy to hold the engine from spinning. And we're gonna go in a crisscross pattern. And again, making sure you're gripping at the end of your torque wrench. Okay. I'm just gonna go around and double check these. Good, cylinder's in place. Now that we've got the cylinder on there, we can do the satisfying engine turnover. Oh yeah, nice and smooth. I don't know why that's so satisfying. Now we're gonna put our head in place. Depending on what type of gasket you have, it may look different. I've got this uh, metal crush washer. That's one style of head gasket. Then here is a Kometic gasket, which looks a little bit different. I believe they can be flipped either way. They're not directional. On this one, you can see it says head. I'm gonna put this on with that facing upward. And this just slides right in place. I'm putting it on dry. There we go. Then we'll put the head in place. You really can't mess this up. You can see it's uh, wider in the front portion and the engine mounting point goes towards the intake side. That will pop right in place like so. Thread on our cylinder head nuts. There's no washers or anything for these. Now I'm just tightening these down by hand because I do plan on removing this head to do some additional work to this. But for purposes of this engine tutorial, if you were to tighten it down, we would use either the same method with the swing arm bolt or the best way to do it is wait till it's in the frame so that you don't have to worry about the engine spinning around. And we tighten these down to 18 foot pounds and you're gonna go in a crisscross pattern. And typically what you do is you work up to the, to the 18 foot pounds. So I would do a first pass at like 11 foot pounds, make sure they're all there, and then do a second pass at 18 foot pounds and the cylinder head should be good to go. Now we're gonna put our reeds in place. Now this is another area where you may see some differentiation. So uh, this is a stock reed cage. Now it is modified, it's got Boyson power reeds on it. So if yours is totally stock, these reed pedals will probably be metal and there will be uh, what's called reed stoppers. They kind of like flare out to the side like this. I'll show you an example. On these V-Force reeds, you can see these, these uh, kind of, uh, these are the reed stoppers right here. They flare out to the side. You'll have that on your stock cage, or it'll look just like this. This is really common with the Boyson reeds on here, or you might have a V-Force reed cage. It won't look quite like this one, but it'll look similar. It's sort of made out of like a plastic material. They all install pretty much the same. We're gonna put a gasket in place, grease it up, stick that in place. This goes either way, it can flip up or down. And then next we have our boot. Now this is the OEM boot. You can see there's a port on the top and it also has stuffers. That's these uh, pieces that stick out the back. They kind of help channel the airflow. So that'll be the OEM unit. Or if you're like me, I've got this UPP boot. The UPP is the brand, uh, but this uh, offers a larger mouth so I can put a larger carburetor on here. So this is the one we're gonna run. Before I put that on though, we'll put another gasket. It's really important that all of these surfaces are good and clean and flat because you don't want any air leaks here. Put our boot in place here. Just make sure you line up all of your gaskets. This can be a little cumbersome. And then these I'm tightening down to five and a half foot pounds. Now we'll turn the engine around and do the stator side. All right, let's take care of our sprocket. We've got a collar that goes in here. Make sure there's grease on the inner lip of our seal. And this collar just slides in place. And you wanna make sure that you don't lip, uh, roll that inner lip of the seal, just like all the other seals, kind of roll it a little bit. And make sure that this, the lip didn't roll. Push that all the way in. We've got a brand new primary drive sprocket. This is fresh from Rocky Mountain ATV. 
those guys are my go-to when it comes to aftermarket and especially OEM parts. A ton of stuff for this engine came from Rocky Mountain ATV. So we'll put this on the splines like so. And we've got a lock washer. This is another one of those washers where they recommend you put a new one on every time and it has uh, little grooves to fit onto the splines. So if you can get that to stay on there, we'll make sure it pushes to where it needs to go. And then we've got our nut and on one side there's a groove. It's sunken in. That way, that one goes in. So try to keep this washer in place. There's just barely enough hanging on there that it can catch on to those splines. Then we'll spin this in place. And I usually put a little bit of Loctite on this, but I actually don't tighten this down until it's on the machine. So we'll just thread this in by hand for now. And when that is tight, this is another one of those uh, washers you bend the tab over, and this is one that I typically do bend the tab. And now we've got, I guess you could call a case saver. I mean, this is really cheesy. It's all plastic. It's held on by one bolt at the top and then a loop that goes around the shifter. The shift shaft, I mean, dude, it's, it, this thing practically does nothing. It's like for looks. Uh, it goes on here with a washer and a lock washer. And I'm just gonna snug that down. All right, now we'll move to our stator side. We've got our stator right here. Get this in place. There's a grommet up here that will be pushed into the case like so. And then you'll see there's two elongated holes on either side, and that's because this timing plate is adjustable. You can rotate it to advance or retard the timing. We're gonna get into that in a minute. I'm gonna put a little bit of blue Loctite on these. And I believe these are Phillips heads from the factory. I'm using these low profile Allen heads. So I think they're a little bit more reliable than a Phillips head. But you need to do either a Phillips head or one of these Allen heads and you'll see why in a moment. So we're gonna leave these a little bit loose so that we can rotate our plate. Now we'll put our flywheel in place. You can see there is a little key in here. You gotta make sure that's in there. You do not wanna forget that. It's magnetic, so it might pull itself on. You just gotta line up that keyway. There we go. And then we've got a thick washer and then this really big nut. So uh, if you go by the service manual, they have a, a locking washer on here. I'm going to run red Loctite instead and spin this on. Now on the other side, we went all torque Nazi. So on this side, we'll use a different method and we're gonna blast it on with the impact. I really do like using the, um, the torque wrench for most of my stuff, but a lot of people like to use the impact gun and usually you can be okay. Uh, you don't go crazy with this thing, depending on which one you have, but you just hold the flywheel and we'll give it a couple blasts. And that should be good. Who are we kidding, guys? You knew I'd use the torque wrench. So I'll show you both methods. If you want to hold a flywheel, that same clutch and flywheel tool comes in handy. For this one, you don't want it to bite down. You just want to get this in the grooves of the flywheel. If you put tension on it, I'll show you what happens. Let's tighten this down and put tension on it. If you try to grip this, it, it doesn't want to, it, it just doesn't work. You got to get it to about where it holds like that. We'll loosen it up so it's kind of loose. And we'll go up against the bench, get our torque uh, wrench set to 61 foot pounds. And it looks like we're already there. So you can see that impact driver works really well. The next thing I wanna go over is setting the ignition timing. Now this is, if, if you don't have any experience with uh, building engines or anything, it might be a little bit tough to grasp. And I think this is a section that when people do these, like do-it-yourselfers do this at home, I imagine that they completely overlook this step or they just, throw it on there, they guess where it's supposed to go and hopefully it works out. Uh, you do need special tools if you wanna do it properly. I tried to come up with a way to use like uh, around the house tools and I'm not really sure there's any around the house tools that could do the job accurately. So that's what we're gonna do now, let's get into it. So to adjust the ignition timing, we have to rotate that stator plate that we put in first. Now to do that, we've got these little windows in the flywheel and they're put there on purpose so that you can get to the head of those bolts. This is gonna be very difficult to show you guys, but you can see the one bolt is there and the other bolt 
right there. So when I was saying that you have to use either a Phillips head bolt or an Allen head, this is why. It's so that you can get your tool in here to either tighten or loosen that plate. If you can't get in there, like if you have a regular uh, bolt in there with a hex head, then you're not gonna be able, you'd have to take the flywheel off and then you can't adjust your timing. So you need to use either the Phillips head or the Allen head. So we're gonna keep it loose so that we can rotate the plate. And then at the top of the flywheel here, back here, you're gonna see a hash mark. That little hash mark needs to line up with three, there's little hash marks on this flywheel. I'm gonna rotate the flywheel to where the hash marks are. There's three hash marks. I'll get it there and then I'll see if I can get you guys a better angle to where you can see it because I know it's really difficult to see that on the camera. There they are. So if you guys can see those three little hash marks on the flywheel, the important one is the middle one. That's gonna need to line up with the hash mark on the case. Now here's where it can get a little confusing. So just lining up those hash marks isn't good enough. The piston needs to be in the correct location of the stroke then you need to line up the hash marks and then you know you have your timing set to stock. So the proper tool is going to be one of these dial indicators. Uh, you can get these fairly cheap on Amazon. This you know, kind of looks like a crazy tool, but uh, really I think you can get these for like 30 bucks. I'll find one and have it linked in the description below. And even like a cheap one is gonna be able to get the job done. Uh, you just don't wanna guess doing this because you know, your, your timing will not be right. So essentially what this does is this tool has a little probe here that's gonna go into your spark plug hole and then there's a meter on top and you'll see if I push down that meter starts spinning around. We're gonna fix this in the spark plug hole and then as the piston goes up and down, we'll be able to see with this gauge if we're at top dead center. So we've got a little adapter that we're gonna screw in here and just make it hand tight, it doesn't need to be crazy. Then we'll put our gauge in and you wanna make sure that it's making contact. You can see right there, we're making contact. And then you wanna tighten this so that your gauge doesn't move around. And now you'll see when I turn the engine over, but I'm gonna use the flywheel. I think that's the easiest way to turn this over. As I turn the engine over, the gauge moves. So now it's not touching the gauge because it's too low. So we'll make another, we'll get the revolution back up to the top and you'll see that gauge will start to move again. Okay, so there we go. So now the piston's making contact with our probe and we're waiting until that peg turn changes directions. When it changes directions, we've reached top dead center. Right there. So you want to find right where it's changing directions, right about there. And we're going to make that zero. Right there. So there is our top dead center. Now if we go, you can see how far away you are from top dead center. So we'll set that back to top dead center. So in our handy dandy service manual under the ignition timing section, this is page 27, you can see it says from top dead center, rotate the rotator, the rotor clockwise until the dial gauge indicates that the piston is at the specified distance from top dead center. At this point, the scribe marks on the rotor and the stator plate should be aligned. Now that can be kind of, kind of confusing. It says at the specified distance. So what the hell is that? Well, it's up here. Yeah, they have the specified distance right here for ignition timing. So we need to go 1.66 millimeters from top dead center with an error of 0.1 millimeters. So that means that we could go uh, in between 1.56 and 1.76 and we'll be at about stock timing. So we need to rotate the engine in a clockwise direction. That's really important to remember. Now, as I move this, one full revolution of this dial is one millimeter. So we need to go one full millimeter and then 0.6 and then we'll be at the right zone. So let's go clockwise. There's one millimeter, and then we have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Uh, can we get it to stay? Right there. And it's actually almost spot on. That is amazing. It's so close, I don't even think I have to move it. If you did have to move it though, you can come back here and there's a tab sticking up on the stator plate. And you can get it to spin 
by moving it that way, it's pretty difficult to do without moving the, uh, the flywheel. So we can move it and adjust it. And then you'd have to come back up top. Just make sure that you're still at the correct distance from top dead center. And now, of course, it's out of spec because I just moved it. There looks pretty good. Still at the correct spot from top dead center. And if you come down here, I don't know if you guys can see, but that middle hash is lined up with the mark on the case. So we can lock this down. So now we have to rotate the flywheel until we can get to our bolts. There's one right there. And we'll snug it down so that it doesn't move. Now get it back to where it needs to be and just double check our hash marks. There we go. And we are good to go. Now that's only if you want to run stock timing. So, you know, that plate is adjustable. I'm running a modified engine, so I'm probably going to advance my timing. But that is the OEM setup and how it's done. I understand it's definitely confusing, but it's good to know. And uh, these little gauges and stuff, they're intimidating at first, but they're really not that hard to use. So now you guys know how to adjust your timing. And we are moments from being done. We're gonna grease up our gasket for the stator cover. Put that in place. Then we've got our cover. And according to the manual, these get washers behind the fasteners. And these will get torqued to five and a half foot pounds. And this engine is done. Thanks for watching my video. If this video helped you with your engine assembly in any way, shape, or form, please give the video a thumbs up. It helps me out a lot, and also consider subscribing for more videos like this. I do, and like I said before, there's an entire series showing the restoration of this Tri-Z. It's a great series, and I highly recommend you check it out. One thing I always like to say in my tutorial videos is to take your time when building your engine. A lot of times, things just don't go together as smoothly as they appear in this video. Even I have some struggles that are off camera, so just keep that in mind. Take your time. You don't want to break anything. Make sure to get a service manual, and I can't stress enough, just just take your time. Anybody can do this stuff. It's just a matter of double checking your work and making sure everything is good to go. I love all you guys. I will see you in the next video. Peace out.